the second Tuesday, we talk about feeling sorry for yourself. I came back to next Tuesday and for many Tuesdays that followed. I look forward to these visits more than one would think. Considering I was flying 700 miles to sit alongside a dying man, but I seem to slip into a time uh, bar when I visited Muri and I liked myself better when I was there. I no longer rented a cellular phone for the rides from the airport. Let them wait. I told myself mimicking Mori. The newspaper situation in Detroit had not improved. In fact, it had grown increasingly insane, with the nasty con confrontations between picketers and replacement workers. People arrested, beaten, lying in the street in front of delivery trucks. In light of this, my visits with Muri felt like a cleansing rhyme of human kindness. We talked about life and we talked about love. We talked about one of Mori's favorite subjects, compassion and why our society had such a shortage of it. Before my third visit, I stopped at a market called Bread and Circle. I had seen their bags. In Mori's house and figured he must like the food there and I loaded up with plastic containers from their fresh food take away things like vermicelli with vegetables and carrot soup and baklava. When I entered Muri's study, I lifted the bag as it I would just robbed a bank. Food man, I bellowed. Muri rolled his eyes and smiled. Meanwhile, I looked for signs of the disease progression. His fingers worked well enough to write with a pencil or hold up his glasses, but he could not lift his arm much higher than his chest. He was spending less and less time in the kitchen or living room and more in his study, where he had a large Reclining chair set up with pillows, blankets, and especially cut pieces of foam rubber that held his feet and gave support to his withered legs. He kept a ball near his side, and when his head needed adjusting or he had to go on to the commode, as he referred to it, he would shake the bell and pony. Tony, Bertha, or Amy, his small army of home care workers, would come in. It wasn't always easy for him to lift the bell, and he got frustrated when he couldn't make it work. I asked Mori if he felt sorry for himself. Sometimes in the morning, he said, that's when I mourn. I feel around my body. I move my fingers and my hands whenever I can still move. And I mourn what I have lost. I mourn the slow, insidious way in which I am dying, but then I stop mourning. Just like that, I give myself a good cry if I need it, but then I concentrate on all the good things still in my life. On the people who are coming to see me, on the stories I am going to hear, on you, if it's Tuesday. Because we are Tuesday people. I dream Tuesday people. Mitch, I don't allow myself any more self-pity than that. I littered each morning. A few tears and that's all. I thought about all the people I knew who spent many of their work waking hours feeling sorry for themselves. How useful it would be to put a daily limit on self-pity just a few Tearful minutes, then on with the day. And if Muri could do it with such a horrible disease, it's only horrible if you see it that way. 
Moody said, it's horrible to watch my body slowly wilt away to nothing. But it's also wonderful because of all the time I get to say goodbye. He smiled. Not everyone is so lucky. I studied him in his chair, unable to stand, to wash, to pull on his pants. Lucky. Did he really say lucky? During a break when Moody had to use the bathroom, I leafed through uh, the Boston newspaper that sat near his chair. There was a story about a small, num small timber town where two teenage girls tortured and killed a 73-year-old man who had befriended them, then threw a party in his trailer home and showed off the corpse. There was another story about the upcoming trial of a straight man who killed a gay man after the latter had gone on a TV talk show and said he had a crush on him. I put the paper away, Muri was rolled back in smiling as always and Connie went to lift him from the wheelchair to the Recliner. You want me to do that? I asked. There was a momentary silence and I am not even sure why I offered. But Moody looked at Connie and said, Can you show him how to do it? Sure, Connie said. Following her instruction, I leaned over, locked my forearms under Moody's armpits and looked him toward me. As if lifting a huge log from underneath, then I straightened up, hoisting him as I rose. Normally, when you lift someone, you expect their arms to tighten around your grip, but Moody's could not do this. He was mostly dead weight, and I left his head bounce softly on my shoulder, and his body sat against me like a big damp loaf. Oh, he softly groaned. I gotcha, I gotcha, I said, holding him like that moved me in a way I cannot describe, except to say I felt the seeds of death inside his shriveling frame, and I laid him in his chair, adjusting his head on the pillows. I had the coldest realization that our time was running out and I had to do something. It is my junior year, 1978, when disco and rocky movies are the cultural rage. We are in unusual sociology class at Brandeis, something Moody calls group press. Each week we study the ways in which the students in the group interact with one another, how they respond to anger, jealousy, attention. We are human lab rats, more often than, than not. Someone ends up crying. I refer to it as the touchy feely force. Moody says I should be more open minded. On this day, Moody says he has an exercise for us to try. We are to stand facing away from our classmates and fall backward, relying on another student to catch us. Most of us are uncomfortable with this and we cannot let go of. Let go for more than a few 